Haruka will be his way out from the Yakuza life. He doesn't want to be the chairman anymore and realizes that it's gonna be a lot safer getting out and starting a new life with Haruka. Or swinging or lifting him to put him back to sleep. It wasn't a good idea to tell the whole world that her adoptive father is tied to the Yakuza and Tojo clan. The entirety of the Hirose family I didn't care about. The game made an effort to make me care but I just couldn't. With them being dead, no one can go looking for him about challenging him or making threats towards the orphanage. Just kind of wish the journey on getting here was a bit better. Yakuza Kiwami 2 is just as easy as Yakuza 6. The only difference is that I actually have to complete the completion list this time. The adventure list is mostly the same. Dining out, eating at every restaurant, taking the taxi, earning a lot of money and XP. There are only two things that are new. The first one was the vending machines. They were also in Yakuza 6 but I don't see any use for them other than a little boost stat and it wasn't required to drink all of the drinks. However, in Kiwami 2, not only did I have to drink all the different kinds of drinks but muscle soda is just the most OP thing in the game. Game. It grants me extra damage and especially on the legend run, it makes everything so much easier. First and last encounter with Ryuji was done in maybe a minute or two and every other boss fight also took the same amount of time to beat. Don't know why this was never brought back in the games that came after this but if I were to assume, it's the part about it being way too OP. And then there are a bunch of mystery drinks and it's RNG on which ones you get so just keep on buying and drinking them until you get every single mystery drink. And then the second thing on the list was Haruka's request. Most of them were easy, going to a restaurant to dine there or buy a certain item at a drugstore or in store. The annoying requests were the gambling ones. I plan on saving them for the completion, but since I didn't want to wait for RNG during the request, I knew some of the cheat items. And unlike other games, I can't buy endless cheat items. These are one time uses. I just use some of it on this request so that later on, I can just deal with the typical RNG stuff with the gambling minigames. Battle list is also mostly the same with defeating enemies, destroying weapons, getting weapons and gear, and heat actions. I needed to activate extreme heat mode 50 times which isn't as good as it was in 6 because I couldn't do heat rush. I thought it was not in this game but then people found out that there were heat moves that were unlisted and heat rush was a part of that list so I probably would have had a lot more fun if I knew about these unlisted EX heat moves. Combat feels the same, maybe it's better because RGG had more time to mess with the dragon engine but ground heat actions are back and that's all that matters to me. And then I also forgot to mention in Yakuza 6, the dynamic intros are great. There's a camera shake, the title comes on screen with usually a Yakuza crest in the middle with a good soundtrack in the background. The bouncer missions are where I just beat up more enemies and it quickly gets repetitive because I had to play the same mission on three different difficulties. It did give me a good amount of money by the end, but it wasn't the best way to earn money. The clan creator is back and it's better in terms of placing exactly where your allies go rather than just hovering over in an area in Yakuza 6. The only issue is that I still don't care about this and now that I have to complete everything, defeating 1000 enemies wasn't particularly the most fun thing to do. I totally spent most of the time starting the game and then going on my phone to pass the time and repeat the process until 1000 were defeated and this is still not the best way to earn money. <laughs> The best way to earn a lot of money was the Cabaret Club. It is back from Yakuza 0 and it's great having to manage hostess and make customers happy but also taking care of the hostess as well. Once I was able to progress enough through each of the Platinum Hostess sub stories, I got more customers coming in, filling in all 6 seats to cater to their specific needs and make a profit from it. Extending the sections for most of the time works out and makes you more money and I never bother with changing the looks of the hostess. It probably does make me more money if I were to change them but leaving them as they were already made enough money for me. Most of the mini games came back from previous games, darts, all gambling mini games, batting. Golf was a part of the other games but it's different where instead of being outside to play golf, you're inside of a building and each round is a different distance. And there's now the bingo game where I had to hit every single panel to get a bingo and I was allowed for only one mistake and it was a fun challenge to figure out exactly where to hit the golf ball. The video shops are also back from zero. Once again, it's another thing that I didn't think was a mini game but I just had to watch 15 videos and Manjon once again took the longest. It was almost a 
a full day of going out with Ron or Isumo 30 times. Milky Nose in the North and the Sun are just weird. It's a pissy minigame where I competed with another guy and blast my P to win. Playing it isn't actually fun. I wasn't winning on easy mode so after searching for answers apparently having a full bladder makes it harder for me to fill the gauge to blast my opponent and the number that I wanted my bladder to be was around 1200 to 1700 and after following what was told I got past the easy one and then eventually the normal and hard versions for both mini games. I don't ever pay attention to the bladder until I need to go out and eat and then when it's full it's time to go out to get beat up and then eat at every single restaurant again. Virtual Fighter 2 was fun to go through all the characters. Same thing for Virtual On. Despite the controls, controlling some of the mechs weren't fun, but having a mecha 3D arena fighter was really fun. Be My BB is more of what I want from sub stories where you come across weird and ridiculous stuff. Kiri gets invited to a building and he sees grown ass men wearing adult diapers and there are caretakers taking care of them. This is honestly a very normal day of playing any Yakuza game. Kiri fights all of them. You get something. I forgot what you get but Kiri just gets in, realizes the mistakes he's made and beats them up and gets out. The legendary dragon goes around to scare people around Kamurocho and this person isn't Kiryu at all. There's a fake Kiryu going around and using the name to get what he wants. So Kiryu goes up to the fake and punches Kiryu who isn't phased at all by the punch and kicks his ass to stop impersonating him. It's pretty much if you decide to mess around and you'll quickly realize you probably should have done this in the first place. Mr. Try and Hit Me is more of a challenge where I need to hit this guy within 30 seconds. If I fail, then I redo the challenge until I hit him. It's a fun and quick one. Rising from the Shadows is my favorite sub story so far. Kiryu is given a videotape from a guy and when Kiryu watches it, it shows a woman at the park on a swing, disappears and then comes up to the camera for a jump scare. The guy who gave you the tape says it's a curse which I'm pretty sure is a nod to the ring or Ringu. You die if you watch a videotape of a girl crawling out of a well. Kiryu then meets this exorcist guy who claims to cleanse the curse of the videotape. Turns out to be a scam but he starts seeing this woman from the tape and wants out. Kiryu was also seeing the woman at the end and she starts to come up to him but Kiryu drops the tape and this probably saved his life. I don't know what she had in mind but it probably wasn't anything good because the previous guy was so happy about passing it on to Kiryu. Because of how creepy the whole sub story was, this is my favorite sub story. Welcome to the modern age involves Date and not being able to get the internet working. It's hilarious seeing Kiryu and Date not getting how the internet works and thinks that that guy selling them on this internet thing is a scam, which turned out to be true. This guy was scamming older people who didn't understand what the internet was. After beating this guy up, Kiryu calls Date about how the internet is a scam and not real, but Date actually got the internet working and the internet would be the main way of getting information in the modern age. All good, bad, and even fake information. Lend Your Claw is another UFO catcher sub story where I needed to help a father get prizes for his kid. It's like the one in Kiwami, but I enjoyed the minigame, so I didn't mind it. The main reason why I liked overwhelming affluence was Virtua Fighter 2. Kiryu bumps into Kane Matsu and he doesn't shy away from showing off his wealth. Challenges Kiryu to Virtua Fighter 2, beat him easily. Later on you see him talking to another man and claims to have been threatened by Kane Matsu over a company or something like that. Kane Matsu then wants to invest in Kamurocho Hills. Some time passes and he's broke. Investing in the hills wasn't the best idea and asked Kiryu back the 100k that he gave him and he has himself to blame for throwing away cash but despite like this, I gave back the 100k because it was better to show kindness even though he's probably gonna repeat the same mistakes. Etsuko is back and looks pretty much the same. She was already old in Yakuza 0 and was one of the better hostesses to make money for the cabaret club. She's been accused of stealing from a store. There's a back and forth and then it turns ugly when a knife gets brought out. Kiryu steps in and saves Etsuko and she can't control herself. Kiryu reminds her of Majima and jumps onto Kiryu and has her way with them, leaving Kiryu speechless on how strong she is. This one was just fun and the fact that she hasn't aged at all, like how does she not have gray hairs or I don't know how she looks the same but she has her way of making herself look the same and is somehow really strong. Crazy for Kathy is about a guy who loves his car so much that he names it Kathy and thinks Kiryu somehow messed with it. He sounds insane. Kiryu kicks his ass and the sub story ends. The only reason I liked it was because it reminded me of My Strange Addiction, a show where people have strange addictions and I think one of them was a person getting engaged with a train and this guy in Kiwami 2 is doing the same thing but with a car. 
Clearing the fog is another funny one where Kiryu meets a man who has a bad memory and to get his memory back, I decide to kick his ass but the guy doesn't want you kicking his ass. There's a high voltage stun gun around you and the guy has his memories back and what he needed to remember was killing Kiryu for 10 million yen. So now I actually have to kick his ass again and his memory is all messed up and Kiryu decides to leave him alone as he doesn't want a hitman coming after him. Yakuza Sunset is an interesting one because it can mean a lot of different things. Kiryu meets a film director, Sugano, and he's having trouble with third sunset movie the original director left and now it's up to him to direct it and he fears that he's not qualified for the job the first two movies were so good that there's no way the third one can live up to it the action scenes might not be as good this sub story could be a nod to movie trilogies where the third movie just drops the ball to complete the trilogy or maybe even yakuza 3 one of the biggest criticisms was the combat in 3 so maybe it's rgg poking fun at themselves or maybe it's an inside joke that the developers only know and put in here just for them or maybe i'm just looking way into this and this director can't live up to the other director that's all it's about who knows Kiryu tells Sugano to make whatever he wants and if the fans see the attention to detail and passion then that's all that really matters Akagi's challenge was a golf sub story and since I already like golf and it's fun this one by default I already like and then there was obviously an Amon fight, but rather than just fight Joe, I had to fight three other members of the Amon family. Kazuya Amon was dual wielding axes, Jiro Amon has a gun and grenades which look really annoying to deal with, Sango Amon has a rocket launcher which by default makes him annoying to fight, and then Joe Amon starts off with a photon blade and then adds another one later in the fight. Now all of these would be challenging, but there's muscle soda and this drink makes all these fights easy. All of them together on the last bouncer mission was a lot harder because one is throwing grenades, one is throwing rocket launchers while the other two are trying to swing at you. This was the easiest Amon fight so far. Ryuji Goda is part of the Omi Alliance and he also has a dragon tattoo on his back and wants to see who's better, him or Kiryu? And that's pretty much his main motivation in this game, which is why I think he's a very dull character. Even the reveal of him being a half-brother to Sayama didn't really do much for me. I'm not gonna think about him when I think back on Kiyawami 2. Well, that's a lie because when I think of a scattered moment, I'll be thinking about Ryuji and Kiryu bumping into each other's heads. But as a villain, I don't think he's great. He has a simple motivation and that's all he does throughout this game, making Kiryu Kiryu's life harder, or well, I guess until the end. I don't think he even cares about the war, he just wants to fight Kiryu. Kiwami 2 starts off with the 5th chairman Tarada trying to prevent the war between the Tojo clan and the Omi alliance, and he decides to go talk to Kiryu and get him back involved with the whole situation, even though Kiryu's made it very clear he wants out, but Tarada gets shot and dies, which forces Kiryu to get back involved with the Tojo clan once again. Kiryu searches for a person to be the next chairman, and that person is Daigo Dojima, and I still don't know exactly why Kiryu chose Daigo. Kiryu said he was charismatic and had the strength of his father. Kiryu basically backed him up even though Daigo was at a club, drinking and smoking, and seems to have no direction in his life. Daigo is the Yoi's son, she's the temporary chairman, and if I had to guess, Kiryu chose Daigo to make up for Nishiki killing his father. Daigo goes through his own journey of getting it together and eventually becoming the sixth chairman. A third party gets involved and they are the Jingwian Mafia. It's tied to Kiryu through Kazuma. A long time ago, Kazuma and Shimano were ordered to take out the Jingwian Mafia because at the time, the Tojo clan wanted to be on top so they got rid of the competition. Little did they know, there were three survivors of the massacre and at least two of them slowly infiltrated within the Tojo clan to get their revenge. One of the survivors was Tarada himself. He faked his own death to cause a domino effect of having the Omi Alliance and Tojo clan fight and destroy each other. The Jingwian Mafia is also what keeps Kiryu in the story because he could just find Daigo, see him become the 6th chairman and then just leave. He has no reason to stay and could just leave Daigo to deal with the war. But since Kiryu was there during the massacre, just like making up for Nishiki killing Daigo's father, Kiryu wants to make it up for Sayama whose parents were killed during the massacre. Sayama is a detective and her job is just to protect Kiryu from getting killed as his death will lead to an all out war. But she has more of an interest with the Tojo clan since her parents were killed in the massacre. She too is a survivor. She was just a baby at the time and wanted to find out why her parents had to die. It was greed and power. Kiryu tells her that he was there and she's pissed at him. No matter how much Kiryu wants to get out, there is something that connects him to current events and it's usually nothing good and involves a lot of people dying. 
She's also the next love interest for Kiryu as well, and while I don't care about this, it's sort of the natural progression for Kiryu. He still has Haruka around and doesn't serve much of a purpose aside from getting taken hostage, but Kiryu has to realize that being a single parent has to be hard, and having Sayama in his life wouldn't be a bad thing as it would help with the parent duties and Haruka could have a mother and father as well. Then I want to mention Shindo not because I like the character, I don't really care about him. What I care about is the song that plays when you fight him because it's a really good song. Shindo just sort of comes in for a fight has a cool like sword battle with Kiryu and then goes away. It's like okay I guess that's it but his song is so great that he should have came back just because of the song but he's just another guy that Kiryu has to fight. Kiwami 2's story goes much bigger with the added Jingwian Mafia and there being an all out war and while I like the atonement that Kiryu is trying to do and still trying to find a way to be happy through Haruka and now Sayama, having the story be bigger doesn't necessarily make it better. Not to say I didn't like the story, I enjoyed most of it but the reason why I like Kiwami 1 so much is because of Kiryu's and Nishiki's relationship. It was a more personal story. Ryuji is just another guy with a dragon tattoo that wants to see who's stronger. Kiryu now can finally move on with Haruka and Sayama and totally not come back for another game. Sayama. I left the Majima saga for last because I wanted to end my journey with Kiwami 2 by seeing what Majima was up to before the events of Kiwami 2 even started. Majima has his construction stuff going on during the events of Kiwami 2 and the only reason I bring this up is because of the Majima construction anthem. It's just another great thing from Majima. Majima deals with Ibuchi who plans on handing over power to the Omi Alliance but I don't care about that. What I care about is Mokoto. He meets her again at this massage place and she talks about leaving the area forever and still doesn't know who saved her from the events of Yakuza 0. She mentions her watch not being the same because the old strap got worn out and replaced it. She misses the old strap and since Majima hears all of this and asks one of her co-workers about when she's leaving, he decides to buy the original watch strap as a gift. Mogoto is on a plane and unwraps the gift and realizes that Majima was the one who saved her life. The watch and the person that saved her were the only things that she had unfinished business with and with it being done, she can finally move on and start her new life just as Majima did at the end of Yakuza 0. Also why wasn't this longer? Majima gets a limited moveset. Why isn't there a game just focused on Majima? I don't think anyone would be a opposed to that at all. 